The Death Worlders, a story by user Hambone. Chapter 18, Baggage, Part 1. 7,200 years before Vancouver. He hadn't earned his name yet, not his adult one. His test of manhood was still ahead of him, and so the men called him Little Runner. Not so little anymore, though. Every time the great heat rose, he seemed to himself to be that little bit taller, that little bit stronger, that little bit faster. And he dreamed of being the one to run down the meat, to be named for providing a feast for his people. And so he ran. The more he ran, the easier running became, the further he could go. He knew that if he needed to, he could run from darkness to darkness. But you only did that if you had to. And you certainly didn't run through the worst of the high day's heat. Even Med had their limits. Boys even more so. No water skin could hold enough to keep cool during the fiercest of the great heat's glare. Even sitting in the cool and waving away the flies could leave men and wives feeling sick on the worst days. Which was why, when he heard the voices, his first response was to stop, step into the shelter of a fat man tree, and spend a little water cooling his head. He didn't feel strange in the way that usually preceded the heat sickness, but to hear voices when he had run for most of the morning? He was not near his village and not stupid enough to stray onto the land of any other tribe. At best, they would have beaten him before sending him home. At worst, only his head would have been sent back to his mother. He didn't run towards the sunset for that reason. The voices did not speak words he knew. There were two of them, quite clear, not fuzzy and strange like dream voices. He could glean nothing from their words, but he could hear something in them. The sounds made when a man and his wife squabbled. The word, cadence would have been appropriate had he known it. Now confident that his head was cool and clear and that the arguers did not know of him, his thoughts turned to knowledge. Who were these voices? Where were they? Why were they on his tribe's land? The unknown was dangerous. He stepped closer, caressing the ground with his feet as the old men had shown him. The voices continued to bicker, oblivious to his approach. What he saw when he peeked around the fat man tree very nearly sent him fleeing for the village, crying his alarm like a startled bird. They did not touch the ground. There were two of them, in the air like a fly but as large as Little Runner himself. Their skins shone like the sun on wet rock, or maybe like mirage, bright and strange beyond his understanding. It was the first time any of his tribe had ever seen metal. Whatever these things were, gods or demons or something else, they scared him, and so he retreated, as stealthy as before, until his spear rattled on a branch. The impossible flying wet rock beasts turned, and green eyes glared at him. Both raised up into the air and began to move closer, chattering excitedly at one another. He had two options, flee or fight. He fought. Some minutes later, after the surprise had worn off, he gingerly approached the fallen wet rock beast and prodded it. His thrown spear had penetrated its eye, killing it at once. The other had vanished like a spark coiling up to the night and its stars. When his prod elicited no response, he gripped his spear and pulled. It came away with a crunch and a horrible noise. The light flashed inside the dead beast's eye. Some minutes later he found the courage to approach again and prodded it with his spear, achieving nothing. He tried to lift his prey. It was heavy, but he managed it. Though it was a morning's good run back to the village, carrying this strange meatless carcass the whole way would be a challenge. He knew exactly where he was, of course. Coming back with the men to show them this thing he had slain would be easy. But the other one had simply gone, like spilled water soaking into the thirsty earth. This dead one might do something similar while he was away, or perhaps its vanished companion would return and take it. A trophy was called for. Gingerly, he reached for the broken green eye. He made a startled sound of pain and sucked at his finger, sliced open as easily as would be done by even the best of the Stoneformer's spearheads. Even dead, this thing was clearly dangerous. But a dead eye that could cut like that 
would be the perfect trophy. It took some trial and error, but eventually he managed to smash out all of the strange rock-like material of the eye to carry home in his pack. A bit of force and grunting broke off one of the beast's lower legs, made of that strange wet rock. Any more would only tire him on the run home. The old men would know about these things, he knew. When he had finally gone, the cloaked Cortai field drone finally became visible again and inspected the body of its destroyed counterpart. A sharp stick right through the optical sensor and into the primary processor, Nagilt commented. I don't know whether to be impressed or offended. Tool use, curiosity, obvious attempts to think about the situation. Oh, dear, Triflo added. Oh, very dear. You can't be suggesting that thing was sapient. You may not have got a clear view of it through your damaged drone, partner, but I did. It was wearing clothes. It was carrying tools. If that thing was a mere non-sapient animal, then I'm a dizzy rat. But this is a class twelve! Triflo sneered across the laboratory at his counterpart. The impossibility of sapient life on death worlds was only ever a hypothesis, he remarked. And any hypothesis which contradicts reality is wrong, Nagilt finished for him. Still, the damage to our careers if we start claiming to have found an intelligent, albeit primitive deathworlder? Ghastly, Triflo agreed. To be shared only among our most trusted contacts. If the Directorate heard us saying such things, we'd both be stuck on frontier survey ships indefinitely. Yes, best to keep it a secret. It won't be secret forever, but at least our own advancement won't be adversely affected. Mark this world as unusable and move on. Oh, yes. Different star system, I think. I quite agree. That conversation, all by itself, saved the human race from extinction. Seven thousand years later. HMS Myrmidon. Cimbrian system the far reaches. It would have surprised Lance Corporal Rob Garland to learn that he was, very distantly indeed, a direct male line descendant of the first human ever to encounter alien life. Given the situation, however, he would not have been thinking about it, even if there had been any way for him to know. The hull screamed. It was exactly the right word, a kind of high, singing noise of pain that sounded like it belonged to the mouth of someone alive, rather than to steel and ceramic. There, pull back! Royal Marines were a well-drilled and professional fighting unit among the very best Earth had to offer. The order was damn near redundant, but Garland was glad for it anyway. By twos, the team moved away from the offending bulkhead, which was starting to shake alarmingly as hunter boarding craft violated Myrmidon. The hunters would almost certainly open with a volley of nerve jam grenades, and they did not want to be caught in that. The ship was in serious trouble, and everyone knew it. But all that meant to a Marine was that you fought harder. He heard Sergeant Vickery report the breach, calm and level. Contact, D-deck, forward. In a movie, he would have yelled it. But this was real life. In real life, you stayed ice cold, reported the facts, stayed on target. The other team further down Myrmidon's length reported contact of their own. He noted the fact, sticking a mental pin in his imaginary map of the ship. Another contact in front of them. None flanking them. Yet. The bulkhead gave, devoured by a hungry whirl of grinding devices that chewed it away from the outside. The maw thus revealed vomited out, as predicted, a spread of little white coins, and every man diverted their eyes. Even so, the exotic energies of nerve jam stung, like a really hard sneeze. But their fighting efficiency wasn't impaired at all, which was why when the hunters charged from their assault craft, they weren't met with a carpet of convulsing and dying men, but with a disciplined volley of shotgun fire. Shipboard combat was close quarters, and the vacuum outside was death. Weaponry that could pierce the hull was absolutely verboten, but 12-gauge flechette rounds were absolutely ideal. Hardly any risk of hull penetration, very little ricochet. Damn near impossible to miss, and the sheer volume of projectiles overwhelmed alien combat shielding, leaving the bare flesh to be ripped and ruined. The first wave of hunters barely managed to get a shot off. The one that did fired some kind of sizzling short spear that jammed quivering in the metal bulkhead behind Garland's ear having missed him only because of adrenaline-heightened reflexes and luck. Jimmy, 
Get a grenade in there, Vickery ordered. Rob pulled back into cover to thumb some more shells into his magazine. He wouldn't be able to fire while Corporal David James was up in front. Jimmy had the best throwing arm in the squad, and it sent an anti-personnel grenade thumping and skittering up the hunter's ramp an instant before another one of those spears caught him right in the middle of his osprey chestplate, smashing him back. He was dragged to cover in a second as the grenade went off, but it had no apparent effect on these hunters. These ones were more machine than flesh, covered in equipment, and their force fields were visible as a turquoise iridescence in the gunsmoke haze. They pounced and danced on mechanical feet that never stopped moving, buying them speed and agility, even in the narrow confines of the ship. One of them actually sidestepped onto the wall and then along the ceiling, cradling a heavy weapon in its two natural limbs, while a pair of some kind of light projectile weapons whined at the ends of two artificial arachnoid appendages that grew out of his back and over its shoulders. Doing so, it exposed itself, and human firepower smashed its shielding, and the creature itself a second later. But not before one of the little crescent shuriken projectiles from those guns nicked Garland's leg, drawing blood. He hissed but ignored it. A second of the larger hunters was knocked staggering by another grenade, and was dismembered by the gunshots. But the third one leapt over its fallen comrade, scuttled inverted along the ceiling for three paces, dropped as the shotgun rounds converged, rolled, came up, and fired the big gun that it was carrying in its organic arms. Sergeant Vickery died instantly as a wad of high-pressure incandescent copper plasma struck him center mass flinging his burning corpse down the deck with a horrific charred cavity where his chest had been, setting the fire alarms wailing and immediately leaving squad leadership in Rob Garland's hands. There were four more of the enhanced ones behind the one that had just killed the sergeant, even as it was finally cut down. The marines ducked for cover as those hunters fired their own volleys of lethal plasma, which scored and ruined Myrmidon's bulkheads and left the steel running like candle wax. And behind them, a small horde of the basic hunters was taking its time down the ramp, content to let the heavies do all the work. There was no second volley, though, and Rob could see that their weapons were glowing like a forge. He guessed that they had just long enough while those guns cooled down to try something insane. Knives out! Charge! He felt the ship shift and the curious dropping sensation that always accompanied a displacement as his team leapt from cover. The move caught the hunters completely off guard, and they recoiled from the assault, spraying their shard throwers uselessly into the ceiling as they flinched and went down in a dog pile as the marines crashed into them, plunging their FS fighting knives into eyes, throats, and anywhere that looked vital. The lesser hunters in the rear, armed only with pulse guns against a team of determined professional killers in full osprey armor, didn't stand a prayer. Marine Atwell checked their boarding vessel. Ship's empty, he called. Garland nodded and took stock. Corporal James was alive and being tended by the medics, but too wounded to keep fighting, and he could still hear shooting from amidships. Most of the lads had injuries of some kind, mostly burns from the close heat of the plasma guns, but nothing to slow them down. D-deck forward clear, one man down. Moving to clear D-deck mid, he reported. Come on, lads. A minute later, when his men crashed into the flank of the hunters laying siege to the stairwell, which led straight to the CIC, theirs was the last kill of the failed hunter boarding action on HMS Myrmidon. Date point. Four years, eight months, two weeks, and one day after Vancouver. The Grand Conclave. Hunter Space. The Alpha of Alphas. Dual respect. The sensor records, as requested, greatest. From the perspective of the Alpha of Alphas, assimilating the data and analyzing it was a sensation not dissimilar to popping a morsel of flesh into its mouth and investigating the unique flavors. That sensation was no accident, having been deliberately engineered into the firmware of its own personal and highly customized suite of cybernetics. Its lofty position granted it the luxury of being an epicure, in many different respects. Meat, obviously, was the visible focus of its gourmand appetites. But it had not become alpha of alphas only by eating meat. The position had been won, ultimately, by the fruits of its other, more urgent hunger. 
a thirst for insight and knowledge that would remain unquenched even if the Alpha of Alphas spent the rest of its days figuratively drowning in data. These particular data sets were full of tender mysteries, which it peeled apart, turning the juicy enigmas over in its mind and slowly stripping them down layer by succulent layer, savoring the exquisite spices of elucidation as they blossomed in its mind. There was much that could not be determined. The feast of information was tainted, brought on by exotic manipulations of the electromagnetic spectrum, which had dazzled and confused the swarm's sensors. The early records of the fight were meager fare indeed, barely an aperitif. It was only when the swarm craft began to arrive in earnest and overload the beleaguered human craft's resources that the information began to become coherent, and that state lasted only a few seconds before the wave of smaller human ships had arrived, reversing the flow of not only the physical battle, but also the digital one. What could be gleaned, however, thoroughly impressed it. Chemical propellant weaponry using warp fields to overcome the problem of their relative glacial velocity across the huge distances involved in space combat, the precision timing of bringing a brood transport's ship down with a storm of weak firepower an instant before a hurdling kinetic missile, ended the ship and the lives of every one of the 200-strong ripping brood. The tactics were exceptional. These humans understood the hunt in a way that even hunters themselves sometimes failed to. Information was controlled, traps laid, escapes predicted, and retaliations evaded. The opening ambush was simply masterful, reminding the Alpha of Alphas of the overwhelming strike from hiding that had won the victory against the Vulza, atop whose chemically treated and preserved skull the Alpha of Alphas now sat. It took note of the data from inside the wounded human vessel, sent back from the doomed broods that had assaulted it. There was little that could be done about the Death World or firearms. So much kinetic ammunition filling the air would overwhelm anything less than starship shielding. But the information as to which tactics had been effective, and which had not, was invaluable. The fusion-tipped spear throwers clearly were inadequate. Too similar to human ballistic armor, they would wound but not kill. And a live Deathworlder was still unacceptably dangerous. The rapid-fire shuriken guns had not scored a single kill. Only the plasma weaponry seemed to be reliably dangerous to them. But it ruined the meat, and was slow to cool down between shots. Hardly surprising considering that the weapons were designed to destroy heavy ground vehicles. Nerve jam was clearly their greatest fear, but it was equally dangerous to the hunters themselves. Worse, in some ways, feeling the agony of one of the brood caught in a nerve jam could stun the survivors for a few fatal seconds. It was reluctant to order more widespread deployment of the grenade launchers. Though it stuck in the craw, the only sensible solution seemed to be to try and develop an analog of the Deathworlder's own weaponry. If they had built it to kill one another, then it would presumably be effective. Some questions remained. The human ship had plainly lost power at some point, and yet had still kept firing before jumping out. This raised an interesting conundrum about the nature of its internal systems. One mystery above all, however, was truly fascinating. The human vessels had danced across the combat volume, blinking from place to place the moment they came under fire. Only sheer numbers had defeated that trick, but there was nothing in the data to suggest how it was done. Only displacement wormholes could move a ship in such a way, and yet there was no sign of any corresponding beacon. The alien vessels simply jumped, without apparently having anything to guide them. The Alpha of Alphas was undoubtedly among the most intelligent beings in the galaxy. But it was a very focused intelligence. Within its own intellectual domain, nothing in the galaxy was its equal. Outside of them, however... Resignation. Distaste. Bring me the Alpha of the Brood that Builds. One of the subordinates sent. Impatient Tolerance. Stress upon it that I desire its presence as soon as possible. If I am kept waiting, the brood that builds will need to find a new Alpha. Obedience. It 
shall be as the Alpha of Alpha's commands. Date point. Four years, eight months, two weeks, and one day after Vancouver. Folk the Colony. Cimbrian. The Far Reaches. Riley Jackson. Did you see the muscles on that one? Riley laughed. She sure had. And as she watched Sergeant Jones, Legsy, spin a tall tale to a laughing audience about how Corporal Murray had hurt his hand, the mental image flashed into her head of herself, wrapped around his waist and gasping. She shook it away. Jones was a non-com, vastly junior to her in rank and from a coalition unit. She'd be risking a ruined reputation and a seriously truncated career, and that was the best-case scenario. Jones' CO, Powell, struck her as the kind of by-the-books hard-ass who'd have her wings thrown in the fire if he found out. Fame be damned. Jones, meanwhile, would be risking prison. While the rationale behind those regulations had never really convinced her, she wasn't about to start ignoring them. Not worth it, she decided. She was just processing the hormonal residue of an intense and dangerous combat operation. But there were options for working that out without violating regulations, even if she was especially fond of big, muscular comedians. Folk the Colony had thrown a big party for the newcomers from the freighter and all of the military personnel who'd been able to get leave, which included Riley. Most of the colony was there, enjoying what was actually some very old-fashioned fun. A big fire, a pig roast, or some local Cimbrian equivalent of a pig anyway. Lots of beer, some instruments, singing and dancing... And sex. That much was obvious. There was going to be a fair bit of that tonight. She was damned if she was going to miss out. To fight the temptation posed by Jones, she hauled herself to her feet, excused herself, and made a slow beeline for the kegs of local brew, paying attention to the locals. Folktha had attracted a certain sort of person, she noticed. They were mostly young or in their early forties at the oldest. There was a certain liberalness. It wasn't anything explicit, and it wasn't universal, but there was definitely the sense that the people here really did have the adventurous mindset and open-minded attitude which might drive them to leave Earth in pursuit of an uncertain future on an alien world. Some of that cavalier attitude manifested itself in the way they dressed, stood, and spoke. She found what she was looking for flipping burgers on one of the charcoal barbecues. Six and a half feet tall, middle-length blonde hair, and a bit of a well-groomed beard. Beefy, strong-looking, and covered in tattoos. If he hadn't been wearing a ring on his left hand to match the girl with the pierced lip and partly shaved braided brown hair who was sitting next to him, watching the grill's fire glowing on his muscles, he would have been perfect. Still, Riley wasn't afraid to strike out, and who knew? If she was very lucky, maybe those rings would just turn out to be the icing on the cake. Who dared? One. Date point. Four years, eight months, two weeks, and two days after Vancouver. Starship, Sanctuary. Deep Space, The Frontier Worlds. Kirk. Here we go again. Kirk looked around. Amir had taken to piloting Sanctuary with remarkable skill, which he attributed to video games and hanging out with the boy racers, whatever they were. The cockpit, designed for Kirk's proportions, sometimes gave him trouble in reaching a few of the ancillary controls, but the ship's control systems were designed to be used by anything and intuitively. He was shaping up to be an excellent pilot. Unfortunately, when it came to interstellar travel, piloting consisted of just sitting in the seat and watching the stars go by, staying in the chair only in case of gravity spikes, which Sanctuary's directorate made Black Box Drive ignored or sudden unexpected masses directly in the line of travel, which were statistically the closest thing to being an impossibility, and in any case the computer navigated around long before any organic pilot needed to become involved. Human science fiction had long imagined exciting and dramatic FTL travel full of rushing sparks of light, or maybe a tunnel of somewhere else. The reality was much less visually impressive. The stars moved. Slowly. That was it. Sanctuary was incomprehensibly fast, with a cruising speed of nearly 500 kilolights. Only the human TS-2 could match her speeds of 50 light-years per hour or more, 
and only for an extraordinarily brief sprint. Even at her velocious pace, though, the movement of the stars was slow enough to swiftly become boring. In an emergency, if they wanted to risk a few burned-out systems, Kirk reckoned that a million lights was within his yacht's grasp, though there was no conceivable reason why they would need to travel so fast. The result was tedium, and the ship's occupants had to spend most of their time finding ways to entertain themselves. For Kirk, that was trawling through the vast archived tracts of the Terran Internet that he'd collected, studying humanity in all its fascinating detail. He'd just encountered something called League of Legends, and while figuring out the basics of this electronic sport had been trivial, it was clear that the players were operating several meta-levels above his own current understanding. Lewis, manning the ship's sensors, seemed to be quite content to giggle at footage of Gricka, cats, all day. Though he'd once tried to engage Kirk by playing an album called Dark Side of the Moon alongside a movie called The Wizard of Oz, Kirk had readily agreed that both were fascinating artistic experiences by themselves, though he wasn't at all clear what additional stimulus Lewis was getting out of playing them simultaneously. Amir, for his part, rarely shared whatever it was he watched or listened to. Now seeing Kirk and Lewis turn towards him with questioning expressions, he turned his monitor to show them. Julian and Allison again, he explained. Oh, shit, Lewis laughed, scooting over for a better view. Hey, we got any popcorn? What is popcorn, please? Vedrig asked, a cautious tendril of light green curiosity infiltrating up his expression bands. Light snack, traditionally consumed when about to watch something interesting, Kirk said. What are they doing, Amir? The Englishman sighed. She's turned a training session into an excuse to tease him again, he said. Kirk inspected the monitor and sighed. Building Julie in a prosthetic foot had been trivial. Sanctuary's workshop was outfitted in the cutting edge of nanofabrication tools, and a medical bay just pseudo-intelligent enough to perform the surgery itself under careful supervision. The hardest part, in fact, had been designing it so as to minimize his rehabilitation time. Tactile and kinesthetic feedback sensors had been crucial, as had matching the weight, the angles of motion, even the way that a human foot naturally spread out and contracted as the weight of the body shifted around. They had spent the whole morning just fine-tuning those functions, dismantling and reassembling dozens of trivially different designs until finally Julian was able to mount one onto the cuff at the end of his truncated leg and immediately say, Yeah, that feels like a real foot. Just to make sure he was properly acclimatized, however, Allison had insisted that he should do some yoga with her. Now it looked like she had an ulterior motive. Kirk's nostrils narrowed, a direct equivalent to the human frown. He hauled himself out of his seat, squeezed past Vedrig, and trotted off towards the gym. This had gone on long enough. Sure enough, he met Julian in the corridor, stumping back towards his bunk with a furious expression, though Kirk was pleased to note that his gait seemed entirely normal and comfortable on his new prosthetic. I'll talk to her, he promised, as Julian stopped and gave him an exasperated shrug. Do. I'm getting sick of this shit. In the gym, Allison was cooling down with some stretches and gentler, easier yoga poses as he entered. Back already, Atsicity, she asked. I figured you'd... Oh, hey, Kirk. Kirk gave her his best glare as he entered hearing the gravity plates automatically adjust around him to keep him safe. I cannot have this, Allison, he informed her. We are on a mission here. I need both your minds on the job. And right now, you are the problem. You have gone from genuine concern for him to taunting him overnight now that he is mending. There was a long pause. Finally, Allison's shoulders dropped and she uncoiled from her cross-legged position on the floor, stood and turned to face him. Okay, I hear ya, she said slowly. But Kirk, I'ma let you in on a secret. Julian is fucking hot. She looked up at the ceiling, like, oh my god, the things I'd do to that man. She spaced out for a second, lower lip caught between her teeth. And? 
Kirk had no idea where she was going with this. She snapped back to reality. Well, that's the problem. I really do not follow you. Allison sighed. Kirk, I didn't get back on this ship to fuck that guy. Well, I guessed as much, but why did you? Most of the others left. This ship feels empty with only the four of you still on it, and I cannot remember the last time Louis or Amir even left the ship. Because I'd forgotten just how shitty Earth is, she confided, tucking a stray strand of hair back behind her ear. Shitty? Allison exhaled, picking up a towel and mopping her forehead with it. What have I got waiting for me back there? She asked. Serving lattes 20 hours a week and fixing bikes the other 20? All so I can afford rent and, if I'm not too tired for it, some time down at the gun range? Busting my ass at the gym four times a week because booty means tips? I felt like a goddamn porn star the way some of the customers used to stare at me. And the blacktop warrior assholes who used to try and get me on their bikes. Ugh. She flung her towel at the laundry basket and it seemed to personally offend her when she missed. There's more to life than having to put up with that same fat scarf-wearing poser every day who came in to order a fucking tall, fucking caramel, fucking zero, fucking fat, fucking frappuccino in a venti cup. I swear that greasy asshole only ordered it because I had to dig through three fridges to make it all so he could stare at my ass while I was bending over. And he was just like one of, like, ten! Ten fucksticks just like him! For minimum goddamn piece of shit fucking wage! Kirk had instinctively retreated to the opposite side of the room, propelled by an instinct shared both by herbivores facing a raging predator and men facing a raging woman. Somehow, she was worse when she suddenly got quiet. There's more to life, she repeated. There's making a difference, like we are here. There's being more than just somebody else's wage slave piece of eye candy. Like, if I'm going to be sexy, I just, I want it to be on my terms, you know? She took a deep, cleansing breath and picked up the towel. Julian's a really nice guy, but he puts me off balance. I know I shouldn't tease him like I do, but I mean, it puts me back in control. Kirk watched her as she opened the laundry basket and dropped the towel into it. I'm sorry. Apologize to him. He is the one you are making uncomfortable. I know, I know, I just... She tidied some stray hair out of her face. We'd get along great, I think. And a big... Part of me wants that. I kind of feel like I have to put a wall there, you know? Keep him at a distance. Would it really be so bad if you gave in? Kirk asked. Yeah, I'd be risking this. I'd be risking mattering, don't you see? Risking? Oh, come on! Sex equals babies. I don't care how careful you are. All the pills and condoms in the world aren't perfectly safe. The odds, any odds, is odds I'm not willing to take, Allison snapped. I will not risk a lifetime of obscurity as some hard-working nobody back on Earth versus this, no matter how good the odds. I think I understand. I do not think I approve, but I at least understand where you are coming from. Allison gave him a tired smile. Thanks. I'm not sure I do myself, but thanks. Just try to dial it back at least. You two work well together. I would like you to keep working well together, yes? Yeah, I'll try. She turned towards the door, towards the quarters, and was halfway across the room before a thought seemed to strike her. Okay, hey she said, turning back. Your turn. Kirk tilted his head at her. My turn? he asked. Yeah, she sank down cross-legged on the yoga mat. Come on, I just got, like, all my baggage out there, and I tell you, it feels pretty good just venting to someone who'll listen. So, I'm here for you, buddy. Come on. She waved an arm towards herself. Get it off your chest. 
After she'd had time to correctly interpret his expression as incredulity, she followed up with, What? Nobody has ever offered me something like that before, Kirk admitted. You are asking how I am feeling? Well, yeah, Allison agreed. What? Is that weird or something? Unprecedented. For real? Yes. Wow, that's kind of depressing. Kirk paced around the room, pausing by one of the small windows. My baggage, he mused. Yeah? I do not know if I am ready. I do not think I can put it into words yet. Oh, dramatic. She winced at herself as Kirk gave her what was unmistakably a tired glare. Sorry. Kirk exhaled a sigh. I will share in time. I think you are right that I need to, he said. But I need to sort it out for myself first. She nodded her understanding and stood again. I'll be here, she promised. And I'll apologize to Julian and try to, you know, go easy on him? Date point. Four years, eight months, two weeks, and one day after Vancouver. Folktha Colony. Cimbrian. The Far Reaches. Ava Rios. Hey, Ava! Ava had volunteered to help with the cooking, and was quietly growing very sick indeed of slicing the burger buns by the time that Haley, Sarah's mom, tapped her on the shoulder. Hi, Haley, how are you? She trailed off, noticing who was standing a little ways behind Haley, alongside her huge husband, Mark. Fortunately, Haley took it for a straightforward, how are you? Oh, we're great, having a great time. I was just, do you think you could do us a favor? She asked. What favor? Ava asked. Could you, uh, could the kids sleep round your place tonight? We're having a guest over. Floating in a kind of stunned emptiness as she processed the implication of that request, Ava heard her mouth say, Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, we, uh, we can do that for you. You're the best, Haley exclaimed and gave her a kiss on the cheek. She left in the company of her husband and one of the most famous women in the world. Just before the three of them vanished into the dark, Ava could have sworn she saw the two women kiss. She excused herself from burger bun duty and squeezed through the crowd until she found Adam, who was hanging out with his dad. You won't believe who I just saw going home with Haley and Mark, she began. Date point. Four years, eight months, two weeks, and two days after Vancouver. Series Base. Saul. Adele Park was not, in Drew's opinion, a pretty woman. The features inherited from her Korean father contrasted a little too strangely with those of her Czech mother for that word to apply. But she used them well combining them with her tailored suit and business-like haircut to present the absolute picture of poised corporate refinement. Seeing her so distressed was a new and appalling experience. You, of all people, she demanded, looking him in the eye after watching the video. Drew could swear he saw a tear there. No, he said firmly. Not me. I don't remember doing it, and more to the point, I wouldn't do it. Jim Reardon, the LLC's security director, didn't look convinced. I've had this looked at by experts back on Earth, he said, mild and unflappable as ever. There's no digital artifacts, no sign of any editing, nothing. According to them, this is what the cameras really saw. And you're going to tell us it wasn't you? Kevo wouldn't. Drew M. piped up. He'd been the first person that Cavendish had gone to, and been trusted immediately. Every man has his price, Drew, Reardon said. Well, God himself couldn't afford mine, Cavendish snapped. Endanger one of my team. Never. He glared at them both. Why do you think I came to you with this? I know what it means. 
it means I'm getting fired and probably charged and imprisoned. But if some bastard is somehow using me to endanger my crew, I won't. Not by my hands. Using you? That's your excuse. That's the best you can come up with. Adele asked, clearly reaching the end of her own patience. What's it going to be, Mr. Cavendish? Alien mind control rays? Voodoo? Nanotechnology in the coffee machine? Drew met her fierce gaze with a quiet firmness of his own. Nothing short of that would cause me to harm one of my crew, Adele. And if I have to go to prison to rob whoever's doing this of their puppet, I bloody well will. Nobody seemed to quite know how to react to that, and Drew was still glaring at each one of them in turn when there was a knock on the door. It turned out to be one of Reardon's security staff. Uh, boss, Miss Park, I've got one of the Mitsubishi guys here. Hikichi Togo? He says he wants to confess to sabotaging the base? He... what? Reardon frowned at his man, caught off guard. He says he's got CCTV footage proving it was him. Date point. Four years, eight months, two weeks, and two days after Vancouver. Folk the Colony. Cimbrian. The Far Reaches. Guyotin. The shortest route from the E.T. quarter to the Faith Center passed along the road outside Folktha's school, which placed Guyotin in a unique position to be the first Gowan to witness a schoolyard fight. He retreated as the door slammed open and expelled one of the young colonists, the skinny female who always carried a camera, into the street. She narrowly missed barging him aside as she ran across the road and out of sight, face a bright red and water streaming from her eyes. Guyotin was still puzzling over this extraordinary sight when the door exploded open again and two young human males came spinning through, grappling with each other. They were doing more in the way of pulling at each other's clothing and shouting than actually hurting each other, but the physicality of it was still alarming. The larger one, and the darker, with a skin tone similar to that of the girl Ava he had spoken to the day before, pulled back from the fight long enough to lash out with one fist, and Guyotin issued a frightening alarm chirp. The blow cracked into the other boy's face with all that trademark Death Worlder force, leaving the Gowan briefly convinced he had just witnessed a murder. But, of course, humans were made of impossibly sturdy stuff, and the struck boy just got angrier and charged into the larger boy's torso, shoulder first, carrying him halfway across the street before they wound up clawing, wrestling, and hair-pulling in the middle of the road. Cubs and clan brothers fought too, of course. Guyotin himself had been part of a vicious spat when he was little that had left him with a scar on his tail and the other cub with a chunk missing from his ear. But this didn't look like a scuffle between Gowan males. This was a battle. A war. It broke up as abruptly as it had burst onto the street when, a universal constant, the adults arrived. Adam, Miguel, Angel, Eres! The change was immediate. The bigger kids staggered upright, muttering, Oh shit! Only proximity allowed Guyotin to hear one of the female cubs, children, mutter, Oh, his full name, to her friend. If Guyotin was any judge by now, then from the similarities in size, skin tone, and facial features, the figure limping along the road was the older boy's sire, which was a very different relationship among humans than it was on Gao. In any case, the chastised body language of a cub about to receive a stern telling off seemed to be practically shared between humanity and his own species, if you ignored the immobile ears. He was surprised when the two started to converse in a language that was completely unfamiliar to him, a rapid action one that sounded like fire and passion in the older man's mouth. Of course they don't have a unified language, do they? He thought. He had grown so used to everybody in the colony speaking English that even the unfamiliar terms in the books on Buddhism that had occupied him half the night had seemed like they must belong to that tongue. He watched the incandescent exchange for a few minutes, before the two boys looked at each other. Adam held out a fist, 
which the other tapped with his own. Good enough, the older Ares begrudged. He looked to the younger boy, whose eye was swelling and bruising badly. Get that eye seen. Vamos. The other boy nodded and ran. Fled, even. Gyotin studied Adam's body language, thinking hard. Embarrassment, chastisement, and apprehension, yes. But also... defiance? As if he felt he was in the right? Finally, the older man softened. Come here. They hugged. Gyotin gave up. There were books waiting to be read, and he was eager to try this meditation they kept writing about. The mystery of human interpersonal relationships would probably prove to be a deeper and more difficult one than the mystery of transcendental enlightenment. That's about an hour on this one, guys. It might be pared down to about 45 minutes. It's looking like it's about a third of a chunk, so let me see. That's another third. That's another third right about there, and how close am I to the end? Pretty close. The last one will probably be a little over an hour. Oh, dang. Okay. That's probably about a quarter then. This might be a four-parter, everybody. I do apologize for that, but these are getting longer and longer. This is one is technically a 96-minute read, which is an, what, an hour and 36 minutes? So, I don't know. We'll see how long exactly it takes me to get through it, but um, thank you guys so much for listening as always. I really do appreciate you. If you would like to uh, leave a comment, uh, subscribe, uh, like the video, all that fun stuff, that would be great. That really does help me out. Um, and uh, there should be a link popping up for the Patreon and uh, the subscription thingy bob, my bob in the box. I don't know what you call it. The, there's also one in the, the description, so that's fun. And you can click that one too. Uh, also, I love you guys. I'll talk to you later. Bye, all Close the thing. Hold on. Lincoln. Come on, bub. Flip, flap, flop. Come here, bub. Stop. Stop snoring. You can't snore. <laughs> I love this part. It's so fucking funny. I love this part, too.